I'm going to ask a question, uh, and I'd like you to answer without thinking. When you first think of the homeless, whose face do you see? What images come to mind? Men. Men? What else do you see? What images? Tell me, tell me, describe something for me. Long hair. Mm -hmm. Dirty, shopping cart, right? Every time I ask this question, almost always I get the same responses. Usually the faces that we see look nothing like ours. They're people whose behaviors are nothing like ours. They are the homeless. They are those people, not us. Now, have a look at these faces. Can you tell me who was once homeless? The fact is that homelessness happens to professionals, to mothers, to people who've always held down a job until one day they lost it. It happens to healthy people, to people who suffer from chronic illness. It happens to happy children in healthy homes. And it happens to people suffering from mental illness, abuse, addiction, physical challenges. Multi-city surveys tell us that the most common cause of homelessness is unemployment. Following close behind is poverty and lack of affordable housing. If you're a woman, violence will factor highly into the list as well. So in this age of bankruptcies and foreclosures, it isn't hard to see that homelessness can happen to any of us, no matter how resilient we think we are. When people describe the homeless, the most common word I hear is lazy. When I tell people that I was once homeless and I became successful, I'm often told that my decision to turn my life around makes me the exception and not the rule. But this is a myth. Researchers at the University of Sheffield in England did a study on time perspective and homelessness. They took a group of 50 homeless people, they interviewed and evaluated them, and then they compared the results against a group of 50 people who were not homeless. Most of what they found was to be expected. Weighted down by their circumstances, they had a significantly higher incidence of depression. They also tended to focus more on the negative aspects of their past, and they had a more fatalistic view on the present. In other words, they felt helpless and hopeless and more often than not, that helplessness led to depression and to a negative view on the past. Conversely, the control group focused more on positive memories and they had a less fatalistic view on the present. They felt more in control of their lives. What surprised the researchers though was that there was no difference between the two groups when it came to future perspective. The homeless group, despite their feelings of helplessness, were actually very forward thinking. They had goals and aspirations. Surprising, right? So despite depression and overwhelming circumstances, most people, homeless or not, desire to make their lives better. The challenge is with the present. When you're struggling to survive, when you're overcome by significant, stifling challenges, life gets you down. You feel anchored in place, making it impossible to achieve significant progress. This is where the homeless story becomes the universal story. This is a story of defeat. And we've all felt defeated at one point or another. If you haven't yet, you will. Whether it's through the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, a marital breakdown, depression, serious illness, there will come a time where the wind is knocked out of us and we find ourselves lost. And thank goodness for social services because when we find ourselves paralyzed, we need all the help that we can get. But no matter how much help we get, after the counseling session is over, after the friends go home, there are still hours in every day where we struggle alone. So I'd like to share with you a few strategies that I used in those times and spaces when I was alone to be able to rebuild my life. When I was homeless, I used to carry a quote around with me. It was by Jules Renard, and it said, if I had my life to live over again, I would ask that not a thing be changed, but that my eyes be open wider. I used to carry that around with me, hoping that one day I'd believe it. But I'd walk by restaurant windows and I'd see crowds of well-dressed people laughing and talking together. They looked happy and relaxed. At the time, I didn't think I could have that reality. I was a teenager. I had just dropped out of high school. I thought I was doomed. I thought I was broken. When we feel defeated, our minds naturally focus in on anything that will help support that conclusion. 
Negative events become highly charged and ever-present in our awareness, whereas positive and neutral events slip into the background. My own sense of defeat brought me so low to the point where I was faced with the final crossroads. Change or die. I needed to find a way to lift myself up before I gave up for good. After the shelter, I was placed into a government subsidized rooming house. I was living on $125 a month. And I didn't have very, very much money to live on, but I bought myself a single wine glass. And on my darkest days, I would fill that glass full of water and pretend it was champagne to remind myself that there's always something to celebrate. Then I would make a list of everything that I was grateful for. I had a roof over my head. I was safe. I was vaguely blonde. <laughs> I was a teenager, that mattered. <laughs> so I was disciplining myself to bring the focus back into the positive. It was really hard work. It was devastating some days, but it changed my reality. Robert Emmons at UC Davis did a study. He studies gratitude normally, and in one of his experiments, he had a group of people make a list of everything that went well in the day. Every night they would do that. Everything that they were grateful for, everything that went well. And then he would compare that group against a group of people who made a list of everything, all the hassles of the day, everything that went wrong. And what he found was that those people who practiced gratitude had stronger immune systems, lower blood pressure, they slept better, they had fewer aches, they were also happier, they felt more alert, alive and awake. They were more helpful, more compassionate, generous, less lonely. And they also were more successful at accomplishing their goals. Now try telling a homeless person to make a gratitude list. It's not easy. It, it's counterintuitive. But I'm telling you that it works. And the pathway to healing, the pathway to the turnaround, starts with gratitude. Let me show you where it leads. Once I had the habit of being able to see the good in my life, I was starting to feel better. I was able to reduce the amplitude of the negative events without ignoring them, and then increase the volume on the positive. It was addictive. I wanted to see more, so I went out onto these excursions, out into the streets to try and find beauty and wonder everywhere. Children dancing in the park, Anonymous love letters, free snow, <laughs> sunrises in alleyways. And I've got to warn you, when you start to see wonder everywhere, you're going to want to create it for others. This is where random acts of kindness are born, which is great, but just be prepared for a few surprises. In my own quest to create magic in the lives of others, I remembered how as a child, Finding a nickel in the park was like finding buried treasure. And so I went out and I bought a whole bunch of rolls of nickels and I went to the park early in the morning and scattered them around before the kids got there. And then I sat on a bench and waited with anticipation. Parents, nannies, and preschoolers started to flow in and as the children played, one of them saw a sparkle in the grass. She ran over, picked it up, and then ran back to show her friends. And then another found one. And the excitement was building. It was beautiful. Then two ran toward another one. And as one picked it up, a fight ensued. <laughs> Off in a distance, another fight. I watched in horror as I realized that I just instigated a riot of three-year-olds. <laughs> Parents and nannies dove into the pile of hair pulling in tears. One of them screamed, what kind of a sick person would do such a thing? <laughs> I was mortified. So. Plan your kind gestures carefully, my friends. As I opened my eyes to everything that made life beautiful, all of the things that made life worth living, and all of the things that were good about me, I found I had the strength to start fixing the parts of me that were bro still broken. Every day I had the simple goal of just becoming a little more me. And as I pieced my life together, my future emerged. I had the vitality and the desire to start recognizing and pursuing new opportunities. And there comes a time as we enjoy the vast vista of what's possible, 
where we turn our heads to our past and we see just how far we've come. Then we return our gaze forward to the horizon and like a hungry predator, we zero in on the biggest, juiciest future that we can see. That's when we become what I like to call a joy vigilante. No matter what challenges, disappointments, or devastations come our way, we take our joy into our own hands and we make our way to the life that we desire. Thank you.